Well, hello everyone. I'm so glad you can join me once again. I know the Holy Spirit is going to speak wisdom into your minds and into your hearts today as you tune in to His sweet and loving voice. Why don't we go ahead? Let's start off with a word of prayer. Let's come before our Father in heaven. Let's pray. Father God, we just want to thank you, Lord, for this time as our hearts are in tune to your awesome and loving voice. I pray as you speak wisdom into us that if we're experiencing any problems, any difficulties in life, Father, your words will speak upon us the wisdom that we need, that we will have great victories. We will know, Lord, that you are taking care of all of our problems. So, Lord God, we place this time fully into your hands. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. And praise God. Well, you may have remembered last week, we started a new sermon series called, What the World Needs Now. You, you may have heard of the song, right? That goes by the same title. But with the song, you know the lyrics, you know, they go, What the world needs now is what? Love, sweet love. And yes, we definitely need more of God's love in our world, which is actually one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. But what we actually need is all of the fruits of the Spirit, which are found in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23. Let me read it to you once again. It says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. You know, just imagine, even if we just had a little more of these fruits of the Spirit in our world today, don't you think it would be a much better, much sweeter place to live in? Well, last week we covered the fruit of patience. But for this week, we will cover the fruit of peace. Yes, for some of us, we may be saying, you know, we just don't need a little bit of it. Hey, we need a lot, like right now, because, yeah, for some of us, we are lacking peace in our lives. So here's a question. What can we do to obtain a little more of God's peace in our lives? Well, look at number one. It says we must be willing to surrender all of our worries and anxieties to God. Did you know that anti-anxiety medication is a billion dollar industry in America? Xanax, America's leading anti-anxiety medication, is so popular that it generates more revenue than even Tide detergent. You know, many users of this medication report having peace of mind when they are using it. You gotta understand, I'm not suggesting that you should stop using this, especially if your doctor had already prescribed it to you. But, but let's take a look at the following scriptures and realize that Jesus offers us something even better. Look what it says here in John 14, 27. It says here, Peace I, live with, I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Notice that Jesus says hearts, not minds, as to what is not to be troubled. For a believer, we know our hearts. That is where Jesus is at. Look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17. It says there, Then Christ will make his home where? In your hearts, as you trust in Him, your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. You know, so when our hearts are troubled and filled with constant anxiety, most likely is the fact that you are not fully trusting in Him. And that is probably the reason why we are so stressed out and, and really we have no peace. <laughs> it should not be that your troubles and worries are coexisting or cohabitating where Jesus is. Look what it says here in John 16, verse 33. It says here, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. 
In the world, you will have tribulation. But take heart. I have overcome the world. So, so what is Jesus saying here? Guess what? Yes, you're going to have troubles while you are still in the world. But whatever that problem may be, guess what? God says, I have an answer for your every problem. But for you and for me, we must be willing to give it over to him to overcome the problem. And where do we do that? Well, the Bible says we do it in our hearts. You know, Paul, he gives us the solution and the steps involved to do this. I want you to take a look at this scripture, Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. It says here, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all that He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. You know, God promises that if we practice these disciplines, He will guard our hearts with His peace. So what are these disciplines? Well, we just read them. They are doing, you, you have to do exactly what these verses are telling us to do to experience God's great peace. So when you start worrying about anything, what does it tell us to do? Instead of allowing our worries to consume us, what do we do? We immediately start to pray about everything that's making us feel lousy and stressed out. For example, you know, we can say, Lord God, I'm worried about not being able to find another good job. Well, then next, we have to tell God what we need, believing that He will provide only what is His very best. So in this case, you can tell God that you need a new job and you can be very specific about it. You can even, you know, suggest, Lord, I want this position or I, I want this salary. You know, it's okay to do that because guess what? Your faith will be increased when God even exceeds what you are asking for. And then what do we do? We thank Him for all that He has done. And, and this is done right after you tell Him what you need. Yeah, even before you have received it. So in this case, you know, this will show how much you trust in him to provide to provide you what he thinks is the very best job for you at this point in your life. And you know, the verse continues that it says, when you've done all these things, guess what? You're going to experience a supernatural peace that is from God. And if you don't, <laughs> guess what? You just repeat the steps so once again, until you will experience the very peace of God. Amen. Well, I got to tell you, in 1555, there was a man named Nicholas Ridley who was burned at the stake because of his witness for Jesus Christ. You know, on the night before Ridley's execution, his brother offered to remain with him in the prison chamber to, to be of assistance and, and to be of comfort. But Nicholas, he declined the offer and replied that he had meant to go to bed and sleep as quietly as he has ever done in his life. Here's the thing. Because he knew the peace of God, he could rest in the strength of the everlasting arms of his Lord to meet his need. And guess what? So can we. When our God fills us with his peace, you know, our enemy, the, the devil... All his lies are about to be destroyed. Look what it says here in Romans 16, 20. It says, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. You know, once God has crushed Satan and his demons in your life, guess what? You will no longer be subject to his lies. His lies that really are the, are the very things that are creating so much stress, worry, and anxiety in your minds and in your hearts. 
You know, when a person is able to release distress and anxiety from his life and have peace within, within himself, it will also be a lot easier for him to be at peace with other people that are around him. You know, as you read the following scriptures, try to see what they have in common, especially the words that are in bold and underlined. Okay, the first verse of Psalm 34, verses 13 to 14. Look what it says there. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. And you know what, brothers and sisters, <laughs> if the truth be told, some of the times, right, we may choose to allow our tongues to speak evil of others and seek to hurt others. Look what it says here in Hebrews 12, 14. It says, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. For without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And once again, if the truth were to be told, right, sometimes we may put in the very least amount of effort in trying to restore our relationships with other people, especially the ones yeah, that have been fractured or, or hurt in some way. Yeah, we put in the least effort where in this scripture, it tells us we've got to put in the most effort. I want you to take a look at the next scripture in 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Look what it says there. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. And once again, the truth is sometimes, right, it, instead of encouraging others, what do we do? We put others down and we hurt them. And if you take a look at all these verses here, you realize that really we have a choice to do them or not. Okay, if we don't, guess what? We only have ourselves to blame when all of our relationships go sour. Because if we do what the Word of God tells us, I'm going to tell you, your relationships will be blessed. So much so, you're not going to have all the stress, worry, and anxiety that comes with relationships that really have gone bad. Let me tell you, there's this monk. His name is Telemachus, and he lived in the 4th century. He felt God saying to him, go to Rome. So what did he do? He left the monastery and put his possessions in a sack and he set out for Rome. When he arrived in the city, you know, people, they were very noisy in the streets. He asked, why all the excitement? And he was told that this was the day that the gladiators would be fighting and killing each other in the Colosseum. And the day of the games, as they call it, the circus. And he thought to himself, Four centuries after Christ, and they are still killing each other for enjoyment? Really? So he ran to the Colosseum and he heard the gladiators saying, Hail to Caesar! We die for Caesar! And he thought, Oh, this isn't right. So he jumped over the railing and he went out into the middle of the field. He got between the two gladiators. He held up his hands and said, In the name of Christ, forbear! And the crowd, they protested and began to shout, Run him through! Run him through! A gladiator came over and hit him in the stomach with the back of his sword. It sent him sprawling in the sand. You know, still he got up and he ran back and we ran back and again he said, In the name of Christ! Forbear. And the crowd continued to chant, Run him through! Run him through! And one gladiator came over and plunged his sword through the little monk's stomach, and he fell into the sand, which began to turn crimson with his blood. And one last time he gasped out, In the name of Christ, forbear. You know, a hush came over the 80,000 people in the Colosseum. And soon, a man got up and he left. Then another 
and then another one. And within minutes, all 80,000 of the people had emptied out the arena. It was the last known gladiator contest in the history of Rome. And what can we learn from this? Well, truly one person can make a difference in bringing peace in other people's lives, especially if it is motivated by God. Amen. So how else can we obtain God's peace? Well, I want you to look at number two now. It says here, we must be able to stay calm even when the worst of troubles <laughs> may come forth in our lives. Because here's the thing, there may be seasons in our lives in which it seems we are plagued <laughs> with multiple problems, one after the other, and some may seem to be more than what we can handle. You know, the 12 disciples of Jesus, they faced a huge storm together. And they were shocked to see what Jesus was doing. I want you to look at Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 to 27. It says here, Then Jesus got into the boat and started across the lake with his disciples. Suddenly, a fierce storm struck the lake with waves breaking into the boat. But Jesus was what? He was sleeping. He was snoozing. And the disciples went and woke him up, shouting, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. And Jesus responded, hey, why are you afraid? You have so little faith. Then he got up and he rebuked the wind and the waves. And suddenly there was what? A great calm. And the disciples were amazed. Who is this man? They asked. Even the winds and the waves obey him. Well, brothers and sisters, to have God as your peace, you must remember that God can handle, hey, even the worst of storms that may come forth in your life. I want you to look at what it says here in Psalm 29, verses 10 through 11. It says here, The Lord rules over the floodwaters. The Lord, the Lord reigns as king forever. The Lord gives his people strength. The Lord blesses them with what? With peace. And look what it says here in Psalm 107, 28 to 30. It says there, Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and He brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper, and the waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and He guided them to their desired haven. Notice that God didn't bring total silence to the storm, but what? A whisper. And you know what? In the whisper, you will still be able to hear the faint noise of your troubles. But guess what? It is almost completely drowned out by the sweet voice of God that brings peace. That is, if you're always tuned in to His sweet loving voice. You're not going to allow the things of the world to distract you to the point that, yeah, you're going to be crushed in spirit. No, you're going to be listening to the voice of God when these times do come. You know, there once was a pastor's wife who was very afraid to take airplane flights. And so her husband asked her to pray for it and, and, and asked her to pray that the fear that was controlling her be gone. And he says to her, let God know that you're afraid of flying and God will help you. So she did that. She prayed and she told God that, you know, this was something she was fearful about. But you know what? As she kept on going to God, she overcame the fear. And now, guess what? She can jump on any plane to go wherever she wanted and she would be at total peace. So one day she was flying with her friend through a very violent storm in a small plane. And the friend, oh, he was sweating it out as the plane was rocking back and forth, back and forth. And guess what? <laughs> she was fast asleep. And when they landed, you know, he asked her, Hey, 
how could you sleep so peacefully? And she replied, you know what? Since I learned to trust in God, he changed me. He has given me that kind of peace, whether it is with or without a storm. And here's the thing. Sometimes God, he calms the storm. But most of the time, guess what he does? He, he won't let it rage. But guess what? He will calm us. He will let us know. He's right here with us. And don't be discouraged when it seems that you are always met with fearful situations again and again. You know, you know what you do? You just keep turning them over to God. And that is how trust is learned. When you keep giving it over to God, yeah, you realize, hey, God's going to see me through this. I know His hand is upon my life. Let me read to you, you know, the next uh, scripture verses that I'm sure you're very familiar with in Psalm 91, verses 9 through 16. It says here, If you say the Lord is my refuge, and you make the Most High your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent, for He will command His angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample on the great lion and the serpent. Because He loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. You know, just knowing that you know these scriptures are for you and for me should put your mind at ease and at peace, knowing that, Guess what? He has a watchful eye on you and on me. And, and sometimes the trials will still have to come forth in our lives, but we must remember that God, He's always in control. Amen? And He will always provide His very best for you, that He will let you know that you are His precious child. You know, in the construction site of a city in Pottsville, Pennsylvania, you know, the, the broken end of a high voltage wire was lying on the pavement ground along which the engineer was walking on and he was unaware of the fact that he was about to be fried. <laughs> you know, there was a worker. He saw the danger and he yelled to warn him, but his voice was drowned by the noise. And so what did he do? He picked up a stone and he threw it as hard as he could. And he hit the engineer on the chest with, with this stone. Becoming very angry, the, the engineer, he looked up. But just as he did, he saw the wire. Just as he was about to step on it. Tearfully, he, he thanked the worker for saving his life. Yeah, the stone hurt, but the high voltage wire would have hey, hurt a lot, lot more. And it was a loving act of concern that motivated the worker to throw the stone at the engineer. And let me tell you, brothers and sisters, when the Lord brings trials and tribulations right into our lives, we often get angry at God for throwing rocks at us. But what we ought to do is to have the attitude of the engineer and rejoice and be thankful for a God who loves his children too much to let them hurt themselves by going astray. So what else can we do to obtain God's peace in our lives? Well, the last one here, number three, we must always remember that God, he's for us not against us. For, for you know, many people, they believe that their lives are nothing but a mess. And they put the blame on God for all the sorrows and hardships that they are facing. You know, some who are unbelievers, even though they may claim to be atheists, they say, I don't believe in God. They will still put the blame on God when, when troubles come in their lives. And that is why they will say they will never go to church or believe in Him. 
Well, yeah, they say they don't believe in him, but still, they will blame him. Yet, there are believers, though, who believe that God is responsible for all of their troubles and woes. Can you imagine that? And they have come to acceptance of it because they believe that they are being punished for their past sins, past sins and their evil deeds. Therefore, you know what they say? They're just going to receive whatever punishment God will give them. A life of strife <laughs> and no peace. And I heard people say this. They say, Pastor, I've just come to accept it. I say, no, you don't have to accept that because God says, I've come to give you my peace. And God, he may be looked upon as a merciless, mean-hearted, and, and terrible tyrant who is out to punish all of mankind. And just loves doing it. This is what a lot of people believe. As believers, we do not have to be afraid of the eternal wrath of God. Because He doesn't want to punish us. He wants to bless us. And we got to realize His Son, Jesus Christ, He bore the wrath of God upon Himself. So if, if we believe in Him, we could have a right relationship with Him. Listen to what... Romans chapter 5, 1 says, it says here, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. As Christians, we should have no doubt and total peace about the fact that we are saved and that He is not against us but is for us because we are His children and we belong to Him that we know for a fact our eternal salvation is secure. Because guess what? He promised us that we will live forever with Him if we put our faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. Look what it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. It says here, For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is His promise to us as believers who constantly look to Him and trust Him. Look what it says here in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. It says here, You keep Him in, look what it says there, perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because He trusts in you. You know, as your mind is constantly stayed on God, is stuck on God, your mind will be at perfect peace, free of fear, anxiety, and anger, and constant complaining. And, and when this happens, you're going to learn to totally trust in God for everything. You're going to have a perfect peace, and you're no longer going to question Him anymore. You know, there once was a man who was very adamantly believing that if he lived by faith, you know, as long as he prayed in Jesus' name, he believed by faith that God would provide for his every need, that he would receive whatever he asked for. You know, one day he stood up in church and he declared that from that day forward, he was trusting God to supply all of his needs. You know what he did? He quit his job as a high-ranking official in a fairly large company and moved into a dingy little house on the rougher side of town. You know, the first night he prayed very fervently for God to send him some food because he was beginning to get pretty hungry. So the next morning he walked outside expecting to find food, but nothing was there. And figuring that he didn't pray fervently enough, he dedicated the whole day in praying for God to provide food for the next day. Well, the next morning came and still there was no food. And that day he prayed even more fervently for God to provide nourishment. For by now he was growing ravenously hungry. And he said, God, you must provide me with food or I will die out here. And he prayed over and over and over again. And the next morning, he walked outside and still no food. And by this time, he was beginning to get angry with God for not providing what he promised in his word. 
And that afternoon and evening, he redoubled his efforts. And he was wailing and rocking back and forth and beating his breast as he prayed. Dear God, I'm going to starve to death unless you feed me. I haven't had anything to eat or drink in four days. And when he had prayed all that he could pray and was exhausted, he fell back on the bed and he stared at the wall. And in the silence, he heard a small voice calling out his name, Bill, Bill. And he cried, I'm here, Lord. Are you finally answering my prayer? And the voice replied, I've been answering your prayers. You've just been looking in the wrong direction. And the man says, What do you mean, Lord? I don't understand. And he was full of exasperation. And the voice told him, Walk outside, Bill. So Bill, he walked outside, and he looked all around on the dirty porch. But still, there was no food to be found. There's nothing here, Lord. I don't see any food. And the voice told him, you're looking in the wrong direction. Look up. And Bill, he looked up and there right above his head, pasted onto the building next to him was a huge billboard with big black print that read, day workers wanted, lunch will be provided. <laughs> well, here's the thing. Instead of quickly attacking God and blaming Him for all your sorrows, right? That you say, I've been praying and God's not answering. You know what we got to do? We got to find the truth in His Word about what God really wants to do for you. Instead of thinking, I want God to do this exactly the way I want. No, you say, Lord, as I pray, I'm trusting in you. And you're going to provide your best for me. I want you to look what it says here in Psalm 29, verse 11. It says here, The Lord gives strength to His people. The Lord blesses His people with peace. And we must remember that when God blesses us with His peace in our troubled times, He also gives us the strength to keep moving forward so that we won't quit. And we will take hold of the victory that will soon be ours if we keep trusting in Him, as we keep on looking to Him. Amen? Well, I want you to take a look at the bottom line verses now. Let's take a look at Romans 15, verse 13. It says there, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in Him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. And when you are completely filled with His peace, you're always going to have much confidence that God will see you through anything. That as you look to Him, you know that God will give you His very best. That God will see you through anything that may come your way. And let me conclude with this uh, touching true story. You know, in 1871, tragedy struck Chicago as fire ravaged the city. And when it was all over, 300 people were dead and 100,000 people were homeless. A man by the name of Horatio Gates Spafford you know, he was one of those who tried to help the people of the city get back on their feet. He was a lawyer who had invested much of his money into the downtown Chicago real estate and he had lost a great deal to the fire. And his one son had died about the same time, but he also had four daughters. Still, for two years, Spafford, who was a friend of evangelist Dwight Moody, he assisted the homeless, the impoverished, and, and the grief-stricken that were ruined by the fire. After about two years of such work, Spafford and his family decided to take a vacation. They were to go to England to join Pastor Moody and Ira Sankey on one of their evangelistic crusades. 
and then travel in Europe. Horatio Spafford, he was delayed by some business, but he sent his family on ahead to just go ahead. And so he would catch up to them on the other side of the Atlantic. And, and their ship, Del du Habre, never made it. Off Newfoundland, it collided with an English sailing ship, the Loch Urn, and sank within 20 minutes. And though Horatio's wife, Anna, was able to cling to a piece of floating wreckage, one of only 47 survivors among hundreds, their four daughters, Maggie, Tanetta, Annie, and Bessie, they were all killed. You know, Horatio received a horrible telegram from his wife, only two words, only two words long. It said, saved alone. And Spafford, he boarded the next available ship to be near his grieving wife, and, and the two finally met up with Dwight Moody. It is well, Spafford told him quietly, the will of God be done. Wow. You know, Mr. Spafford was understandably almost overcome with grief. He had lost his property. His four precious daughters were buried beneath the dark waves of the sea, and his wife was stricken with grief on the other side of the world. And Spafford, he could have relied on earthly wisdom and turned his grief into bitterness. He could have tried to sue the pants off of the French steamer company by filing lawsuits. He could have justified in his own mind being angry with God and the world and shaking his fist at the one who allowed his earthly life to be seemingly be destroyed. But instead, he put all his trust in God and he wrote a song that has comforted thousands since that time. And let me just read the lyrics to, to this song. It says, When peace, like a river, attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, It is well, it is well with my soul. You know, brothers and sisters, when the Lord is truly your peace, you will realize that it is always well with your soul, no matter what may happen in your life. You will always know that God is providing you His peace at all times. And here's the final word. You got no God, there's no peace. However, if you know God, you will know peace. Because guess what? If you know Him, you're gonna know that His peace is so awesome. You know that is so good, especially in those times when, yeah, you may have problems, you may have trouble. You're going to know, brothers and sisters, that He is always there for you. Amen. Praise God. Let's go ahead. Let's bow our heads. Let's bow our hearts. Let's come before our Father in heaven. Let's pray. Father God, we just want to thank you, Lord, for the message that was spoken today. And I just pray for my brothers and sisters right now, Lord, if they're not experiencing your peace, if they're just full of stress and anxiety and worry, Father, I just pray that as they call on the name of your son, Jesus, they will experience a peace like no other. They will know, Lord, that it is you that's giving them the peace and the strength right now to keep moving forward so that they will have great victories in their lives if they keep trusting in you. Father, we thank you for what you have started in our lives and what you will continue to do. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Praise God and praise God. Well, tune in next week as we cover part three.
of the sermon series, What the World Needs Now. I'll see you next week. And don't forget, give God all the glory. Amen. We'll see you, brothers and sisters. God bless you.